there's been a great response and um, Zoom is quickly filling up. If uh, we do run out of places um, on the tour, there are only a set number of spaces on Zoom, unfortunately. We will be screening the event live on Facebook and uh, you can go to the South African Zionist Federation um, Facebook page where hopefully you'll uh, like our page as well um, to find out about our events and news um, and also watch um, the event if you're unable, you know people that are unable to um, still get on to the, uh, to the tour. Um, tonight is Tubishvat, and um, the JNF has organized uh, this event. We are one of the oldest Jewish organizations in South Africa. We've been around for 120 years. This is our 120th anniversary, believe it or not, and uh, have made a tremendous contribution, not only to buying the land of Israel, but developing it. Um, agriculture, dams, forests, roads, parks um, have all um, come about with the money from diaspora Jewish communities, um, of which South Africa has played a, a major, major role. And hopefully tonight um, in the tour, you'll see some of the contributions that South Africa um, has made to the development of the land of Israel. Um, we're a new committee um, at the JNF. We're not only looking to the past, we're looking to the future and to grow. We're a new, young, dynamic committee. And I'd like to, that's just come into office. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for all the work that they've put in. Um, Benji Schulman, um, Yoni Kowenski, and of course, Ala Britta Feldman, who's our, our LAF president. Um, and uh, we've also got a new national director at the JNF now. Bev Schneider, who I'd like to, to start by thanking um, immensely for all the work that went into all the Tubishvat celebrations around the country. Um, and uh, we, we're very happy uh, to have you on board. I'd like to, with me tonight is also Rowan Polivan, who is the national chair, chairman of uh, the South African Zionist Federation. And uh, Rowan and his team have also helped us tremendously in marketing and uh, distributing uh, information about tonight's event. And I'd like to call on Rowan to, to say a few words. Thanks so much, Mike, and uh, welcome to everybody. And it's amazing to see such a large group of people. Chag Sameach, Erev Tov, and I uh, hope you really enjoy the evening ahead. So as you might see in the background, I'm virtually and symbolically in the Yatir Forest in Israel, which is located in the southern slopes of uh, Mount Hebron, which is on the very edge of the Negev Desert. And the Yatir forest is actually the largest planted forest in Israel. There are over 4 million trees that have been planted in this forest since 1964 through the remarkable efforts of JNF KKL, which planted these trees against all odds. And eventually this desert has bloomed, the forest has bloomed. Uh, and it reminds me always of, of uh, Isaiah, who is, says in the Bible, the deserts will rejoice. Joyce, the flowers will bloom in the wilderness. And I think it's such a remarkable metaphor between this forest and the land of Israel, and a remarkable way to speak about Tubishvat, which we are celebrating today. So Tubishvat, I think, celebrates and expresses a very down-to-earth form of Zionism. It highlights the unbreakable bond between the Jewish people who are rooted in our homelands of Eretz Israel and the relationship between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. This is a, a loving relationship, a re relationship which has transformed the land. It's turned it into the blooming forest that we know of today in the wilderness of the Middle East. And it has shown Israel's ability to not only to survive, but also to thrive in, uh, in the desert in extremely difficult and tough conditions. And the land has transformed and sustained us as a people. And I believe it will do so for many, many centuries to come. And I think that one of the reasons, amongst many, many reasons that someone could be a Zionist is because of this love of the land and because of environmentalism. Israel uh, research and development and innovation is worldwide famous for its contribution to water management, to alternate energy, to agriculture, and to these gifts that Israel keeps giving from this land to the world. So with those words, I invite you to enjoy uh, this, this tour tonight. Have a great time, and thank you, and uh, enjoy. Thanks for the warm words, Ryan. 
So, as everyone knows, tonight is uh, the beginning of Tu Bishvat, um, but today was also a very momentous day in the Jewish in the in the Jewish calendar. Today was International Holocaust Memorial Day, when uh, the world recognizes the horrors that befell the Jewish people during the Second World War, and I think it's not, um, you know, ins- insignificant that Tu Bishvat follows Holocaust Memorial Day, especially in this year where we're in the midst of a global pandemic. Tu Bishvat is, is a day that symbolizes hope, renewal, planting, life. And it comes to remind us that for everything, there is a season. Even in the darkest and coldest winters, we, we plan for the spring. We focus on the planting. And so, um, you know, I'm reminded of the story um, of the JNF Blue Box that was found in the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto. It's always been something that I found very moving to think that during the Holocaust, in the, in the midst of the, of the ghetto, um, Jews were still collecting funds to think about um, building trees and developing the land of Israel. Israel and J- JNF has always been a symbol of life and hope for a cleaner, better world for the Jewish people. And in that spirit, um, we're going to start this evening's proceedings with a tree planting ceremony in the South Africa forest in Israel. Um, We hope that this is the beginning of a season of growth, renewal, and we put uh, the long winter that we've all been through um, behind us. So David, I'm gonna ask you to please start um, by playing the video of uh, the tree planting ceremony in Israel. Chag Sameach, South Africa. How are you? Welcome to the Tzora Tree Planting Center, not so far from Jerusalem. And we are very happy uh, to welcome you here for the celebration of Tu Bishvat. So what is Tu Bishvat about? Why actually in the middle of the winter we are celebrating a feast for the trees? Chag Ha'ilanot. Because if you're looking around, you can see that the beginning of the blooming of the trees starting now. We're also counting the years from the time we are planting a tree, the three first years until we are allowed to eat the fruit through Tu Bishvat. In the time of the temple, what the date where from this date and on, you will give the donation to the poor, to the Levites, to the priests, you will give them from Tu Bishvat and on. But let's go back only 100 and 20, 30 years ago, the beginning of Zionism, Jews starting to come back to Israel. And the first Aliyah was established in 1882, brought Jews, especially from east of Europe, to build here colonies, Moshavot. One of them is Zichon Yaakov, not so far from Haifa. So the school teacher of Zichon Yaakov, his name was Zeev Yavitz, and he decided on Tu Bishvat to take all the kids outside the Moshava and to plant some trees in the foothills of the Carmel. But only in 1906, the Karen came to Israel, the Jewish National Fund decided to adopt it so every kid around Israel will plant trees on Tu Bishvat. This will be an educational tool to link and to connect the kids to the land of Israel. So we invite you today to do it with us. Why actually we're planting trees? Just remind you that the most important reason is to make sure that this land is ours. So every tree you see in Israel, like a green soldier who keeps the land for the future, for your futures here in the land of Israel. Dear JNF KKL friends of South Africa, the Tu Bishvat Festival is the essence of what KKL JNF represents. Today, the Tu Bishvat Seder has been adopted as a worldwide custom, serving a symbolic affirmation of the Jewish connection to the land of Israel. We wish you an enjoyable and an ex- meaningful experience during this planting here at the Tzora Forest. May we know better times where you will be able to come and plant a tree with us here in Israel. We wish you all Chag Sameach and a lot of health and happiness. Dear friends, Tu Bishvat Sameach, 
Here at the tree planting center of the JNF, the foothills of Jerusalem, everyone has got the privilege and the uh, opportunity to plant one's own tree while arriving in Israel. Due to COVID-19, we still have this tree planting, but via Zoom. While traveling in Israel, one has the privilege to see forest landscape, but I think one doesn't realize that this forest landscape was planted. It was planted by pioneers who arrived in Israel about 120 years ago. But the vast majority of the planted terrain in Israel was planted in the 50s and the 60s of the last century. Right after the creation of the State of Israel, tens of thousands of newcomers were employed by the JNF by tree planting. They have planted about 240 million trees, which makes together a quarter of a million acres. This is our forest landscape. In once a desolate land, there are many trees growing now. Trees that have been planted. Deciduous trees, evergreen trees, and coniferous trees. These are the trees that the Jewish National Fund has planted to green up the land of Israel, to prevent erosion, to create recreation, to better the land, to stabilize the land. So wherever you are, please plant a tree. Our Heavenly Father, you who build Zion and Jerusalem, take pleasure in your land and bestow upon it of your goodness and your grace. Give due for a blessing and cause beneficent rains to fall in the season, to satiate the mountains of Israel and her valleys, and to water there every plant and tree. And these saplings which we plant before you today, make deep the roots and wide their crown, that they may blossom forth in grace among all the trees in Israel for good and for beauty. Look down from your holy place, from heaven, and bless this land that it may flow again with milk and honey. Amen. <laughs> Hello again, and welcome to our Seder uh, Tubishvat. You are welcome to um, participate with us and to join us. So, what is Seder Tubishvat all about? When rabbis from uh, Spain were expelled and arrived to Israel, especially to the city of Safed, Sfat, they established a tikkun, kind of a seder, an order for this uh, holiday of Tu Bishvat. And they decided that they will bring about 30 kinds of fruits to eat, symbolizing Israel. Especially, of course, the seven species of Israel. And then they decided also to make it almost like the seder of Pesach. You remember in seder Pesach we have four cups of wine. But here we have different colors. Each of them symbolize another period of time during the year. The white one will be the autumn. The one after is a mixture of white and red. This will be the winter. The winter is the beginning of the rejuvenating. This will be the date of Tu Bishvat right in the middle. Then come the spring, everything full of colors, everything flourishing, blooming, and we ending, of course, with the season of the summer, the hot summer, especially in Israel. That will be the red wine. For many, many years in the diaspora, back home, even in South Africa, you are eating dry fruits. Therefore, there's no reason to continue with that custom. We can eat today fresh fruit that grow here in Israel. 
And hopefully, very soon, you'll be able to join us and to eat with us the fresh and tasty fruit of Eretz Israel. Like in Shabbat, first we are blessing on the wine, then we'll bless on the fruit, and Chag uh, Sameach. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Mecholam, Borei Priya Gefen. Following the wine, we'll bless, of course, the fruit. The manual will be the date, the tamar. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Mecholam, Borei Priya Etz. I would like to uh, finish with the blessing of God to us that bring us to the land of Israel. For the Lord, your God, bring you into a good land, a land of wheat and barley, fine fig trees and pomegranate, a land of olives and honey. Lechaim, South Africa. JNF, South Africa. Lechaim, have a great, great Tu Bishvat. Again, a big thank you to the KKL for organizing that um, despite the lockdown. Um, the South African Zionist Federation, uh, the South African JNF, together with the, the, the Zionist youth, a few Zionist youth movements, also did our own tree planting ceremony um, on the Linksfield Ridge. And uh, we'd just like to share a short video of that. So, David, do you want to kick us off? JNF South Africa are here at the Linksfield Ridge with the soldiers, Bena Kiva and Beitar for Tubishvat to plant a tree. This is a Moringa tree, which in African culture is known as the tree of life. And uh, we're celebrating Tubishvat, which is the birthday of the trees today. And we wish for the year ahead for everyone, growth, life, success, hope, and renewal. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for everyone. And uh, so as part of our Tubishvat uh, initiative this year, we're encouraging people uh, to, to plant their own trees in their own homes, take pictures of it and post it on our Facebook page. Also, if you'd like to plant a tree in the land of Israel, to please contact our office or email us or, or, come, or come to us, contact us via our Facebook page, and we will happily plant um, trees on your behalf um, in the South Africa forest um, in Israel, or um, JNF South Africa also runs um, uh, education centers in, 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 in poorer communities in South Africa, in Mamalodi, in, in Gauteng, and also in, in Durban. And uh, we're happy if you'd like to contribute towards uh, fruit trees um, that, we're, that we're planting in those, in those communities to promote uh, sustainable uh, development and uh, fighting hunger at this difficult time in South Africa. So please, everybody, um, for Tubishvat, in memory of Tubishvat, we'd really encourage you to, to plant a tree um, for the special holiday as well. So thanks a lot. Um, now I'd like um, to start with a special thank you uh, to our uh, former chair lady and uh, president, now president of the JNF, Ala Feldman, um, she retired at the end of last year when, when I took over as the new chairman. And uh, KKL has is put together a golden certificate for Ayla um, to say thank you, a very special golden certificate, to say thank you for over 31 years of service um, to the, the JNF. She's played every role in the organization you can think of, from tour guide to fundraiser to secretary um, to chairperson to president she, she really is trees the blue box and Isla Feldman are the symbol of the JNF in South Africa and we just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Isla 
um, and all the work that she's put in um, over many, many, many years. Isla has also taken, I don't know, tens of trips, JNF tours to Israel. And so I'd like to give Isla an opportunity um, to speak and also to introduce the tour um, tonight um, that we're going to hold on the south of Israel, our, our actual tour. So I'm going to now hand over to Isla Feldman. Thank you, Marco and Orna, for those kind words. Um, they've been very, very exciting years. And uh, also, I was headed up the South African Zionist Federation, so I have dual loyalties to both organizations. So thank you, everybody, for joining us on this Tu Bishvat Tour Down South. Many of you joined me many times on the uh, South African uh, JNF tours to Israel over 20 something years. And some of you even went on the Israel Now tours, which from the Zionist Federation, which we did, and which were very successful as well. So tonight you're going to have an experience which will bring back all the memories of those wonderful experiences that you had. And I hope that when the COVID crisis is over, I'll invite one day, you will be able to come with us and see the most wonderful miracles that JNF has performed since those tours. And because they're turning 120 years, they're not old, they're 120 years young. So just sit back and enjoy this wonderful experience in the south of Israel. And hopefully, if JNF agree, we might do one to the north of Israel, because we have many projects both in the south and in the north. So Chag and Sit, sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Dear friends of South Africa, I would like to invite you today to join us to the fantastic virtual tour of the Western Negev and the Gaza border. Since you cannot be with us here today, we have decided to bring Israel to you. We're going to take you through wonderful sites that KKLJNF has developed over the years, focusing on the donations from South Africa. I sincerely hope to see you here with us in the near future, touring Israel for real, exploring Israel, and helping JNFKKL to make Israel a better place to live in. Welcome, my friends. I am Brian Shapiro, a tour guide, and we are going to be going on a virtual tour I'm going to ask you to look after yourselves, wear a hat outside, make sure your whiskey bottle is full. I would want you to dehydrate. Guys, let's have a good time. Follow me. My friends, what do we have planned for you today? And here being in the envelope area around Gaza, we're going to be meeting many of the issues and the points that have helped to be able to bring the desert to a green and beautiful place that it is now. We're going to go to communities. We're going to see agriculture. We're going to see how these communities deal with security, deal with the fires. We're also going to see how water has been brought to this corner of a very dry part of Israel. We're also going to be meeting people in those villages and we're also going to be partaking and maybe eating, if you're good, some of the agricultural products. Not only that, we're going to go back into our past. We're going to go into the close history. We're going to hear about the Australians and the Anzacs in 1917. And we're also going to go even further, back 1,500, 2,000 years ago to see our history here in Israel. As we have said, we will be touring today along the Gazan Strip and visiting Israeli communities there, something like 60 kilometers along the border. We are leaving the center of Israel and we are traveling south along the coast till we meet the Gazan Strip area. Our first stop is Kibbutz Zikim. And Yoshev, can you tell more about Meshek Kibbutz Zikim? What's your name? Thank you. Tell me, what is it? קיבוץ זיקים, איפה אנחנו? אנחנו בקיבוץ שנמצא ליד רצועת עזה, מדרום לאשקלון, 
במישור החוף הדרומי, על שפת הים. חוץ משפת הים, אתם על שפת משהו אחר, נכון? על שפת רצועת עזה, כן. איזה מרחק? קילומטר וחצי. איך זה משפיע על אורך החיים שלכם? אנחנו הרבה שנים נמצאים תחת אה, איום של טרור, אה, אבל התרגלנו לחיות עם המציאות הזאת, ואנחנו יודעים איך להתמודד עם הסיטואציה שנכפית עלינו מעת לעת. איזה אמצעים? מסביב יש מיגון? איך אתם חיים? כן, יש הרבה מאוד אמצעי מיגון בקיבוץ, גם במרחבים ציבוריים, גם בבתים של אנשים, ערוכים לכל תרחיש. אנחנו יושבים כאן בבית עתיק מדהים. מה אתה יכול לספר לי על הבית הזה? זה בית שהוקם בשנת 1920 על ידי משפחת ארמי שגרה בזמנו באזור. המפורסם מירושלים. הבן דוד של המפורסם מירושלים, כן. כשהקיבוץ עלה לקרקע, הבית הזה שימש להרבה מאוד שימושים של הקיבוץ, חדר אוכל, ספרייה, מחסן בגדים, בית תינוקות, מרפאה. הקיבוץ היה כאן. הקיבוץ היה כאן, זה מרכז הקיבוץ היה. לפני כעשר שנים החלטנו לשפץ את הבית. קיבלנו תרומות מקק"ל אוסטרליה וגורמים נוספים עם כסף שהקיבוץ השקיע והיום הוא משמש כמרכז כנסים, אירועים, רוח קבוצות, תצפית מהגג, זה הבית. אנחנו נמצאים על הגג של בית אלמי, אנחנו רואים מכאן תצפית 360 מעלות מחוף הים במערב, אגם שקמה, בסיסי צה"ל, רצועת עזה, נתיב העשרה, שדרות הרי לכיש, מצפון לנו נמצא אזור התשתיות הלאומיות שנמצא בסמוך לאשקלון ומתחתנו פרוס כל הקיבוץ. אני רוצה לחזור לנושא של הילדים כאן בקיבוץ. איך הם מצליחים להתמודד ולחיות חיים נורמליים במצב כזה? הילדים לומדים לחיות לתוך המציאות הזאת. יש מיגונים בכל מקום, גם בגני השעשועים, במרחבים הציבוריים. והילדים יודעים שאם יש התראה של צבע אדום, הם רצים למרחב מוגן, מחכים שתעבור ההתראה וממשיכים לשחק. בוא נשחק? בוא נשחק. איזה יופי של ציור. שלום. שלום. והיה שעכשיו יש צבע אדום, אז מה עושים? הילדים נכנסים לתוך המיגונית בריצה ומחכים שם כמה דקות עד שיעבור הזמן שצריך להמתין וחוזרים חזרה לשחק בגן השעשועים. תגיד לי, כמה זמן יש לילד מהצבע האדום להגיע למיגונית? בין 10 ל-15 שניות, זה מעט זמן. כשזה ילדים קטנים אז המטפלות עוזרות להם לרוץ, ילדים גדולים רצים לבד. והילדים מודעים לזה? הילדים מודעים, מאוד מתורגלים, עושים להם תרגולות גם כדי שידעו מה לעשות. כן, זו מציאות שאנחנו חיים בה. איזה ילדות, אבל לפחות עם הרבה צבע, משהו מאוד מאוד יפה. עם הרבה צבע, בזכות קק"ל דרום אפריקה, שתרמו פה אומה נכבדת, ועזרו לנו מאוד לאפשר לילדים לחיות חיים רגילים עד כמה שאפשר. וכמו שאתם רואים, הילדים שמחים ומשחקים. If you look out of the window to the right, you can see the Gaza Strip. Let's talk about Steyrot. Unfortunately, so well known because of rocket attacks. A periphery town so far from the center of Israel, definitely not an easy place where to live. Over the years, the JNF KKL have invested so much in this town. In fact, the name Steyrot is from the boulevard of trees that the new immigrants planted while working for the JNF in the early 1950s. We're going to meet Kobi, the Kabat, who is the head of security of Steyrot, to understand what does it mean to live here. Shalom Kobi, what's your name? Shalom, my name is Baruch Hashem, everything is fine. What is Steyrot? A nice place, a nice place, or not? If we take the issue of the security and put it on the side, Steyrot is a beautiful place. It's a place עם אווירה של כפר, של מושב. וזה שאתם רחוקים מהמרכז, מתל אביב, מירושלים, במשך השנים זה השפיע? היום אנחנו כבר לא כל כך רחוקים, היום כבר יש תחנת רכבת, 45 דקות אנחנו במרכז עזריאלי בתל אביב, שותים שם כוס קפה טוב, אספרסו, ויכולים לחזור מיד. אנחנו כאן עומדים על גבעה בשם גבעת קובי, נוף מדהים, מה אנחנו רואים כאן? 
אנחנו יכולים לראות בעצם את צפון רצועת עזה. בצפון אנחנו יכולים לראות את העיר אשקלון. יש את תחנת הכוח איפה שהרובות שם, רוטנברג. מה שמעניין בתחנה הזו, אנחנו מספקים כ-75% מתצרוכת החשמל של הפלסטינים, והם יורים עליה. אז ברוכים הבאים למזרח התיכון, הכל אפשרי פה. המרחק מהנקודה שאנחנו עומדים בה ועד לבית הראשון בבית חנון הוא קילומטר 700. קובי, תגיד, את האמת, אתם מרגישים בטוחים? ילדים מצליחים לגדול ולצמוח כאן? העובדה שכן. להגיד לך שזה קל? לא. אחת הבעיות הקשות שלנו זה הנפגעי טראומה. וכשאני מדבר על טראומה, אני מדבר איתך על uh, טראומה תמידית, אין אצלנו פוסט-טראומה. אני מדבר איתך פה על ילדים שב-2001, כשהכול התחיל פה, כל הסבבים האלה התחילו פה, הם היו בני 3-4. אני מדבר איתך על ילדים שפוחדים להיות לבד בלילה, על ילדים שמרטיבים במיטה, על ילדים ש... תאר לך שבבחינת הבגרות שלהם, ארבע, חמש פעמים היו צריכים להיכנס מתחת לשולחן. מאוד משתדלים לעזור להם, אבל זה לא פשוט. לא פשוט. In order to help the children who have suffered so many years of trauma and stress due to the security situation, the JNF KKL have helped in the establishment of the Children Animal Assisted Therapy Center. Moreover, the JNF have helped in the building of a protected playground, allowing kids of all ages to play even when the missiles are falling outside. <laughs> קובי, אתה חצי שעה עומד ומסביר שקשה לחיות פה, והטראומה, ו... ואיך זה בכל זאת קורה שמתפתח פה והכול גודל וכולם באים? שתי אפשרויות, או שאנחנו פסיכים, אנחנו גרים במקום שכל רגע נתון יכול לקרוא לנו משהו, אבל אני חושב שמעבר לכל מה שסיפרתי לך, יש בנו גם קצת ציונות. אני יכול לבשר לך שאנחנו היום נושקים ל-30 אלף איש, בעוד חמש שנים אנחנו נהיה פה 50 אלף איש. You might be surprised to hear that the JNF KKL have over the last couple of years invested tremendous effort in land preparation and infrastructure for the building of new neighborhoods here in Steyrot. And one is called the Music Neighborhood because from Steyrot there have been a stream of singers, artists and music groups. In the center of the neighborhood, the JNF has built a large playground and a lake to attract tourists. הקהל עושים פה עבודה מדהימה. זאת אולי הזדמנות גם להגיד להם תודה על כל מה שהם עשו בשבילנו ועושים פה. כי כל מקום שאתה הולך, אתה רואה שלט של קק"ל ובסיוע קק"ל. רק שאפו אני יכול להגיד עליהם. רק שאפו, באמת שאפו. Having heard a little bit about the town, let's drive through and see some of the areas the JNF have helped. To the right, you can see the resilient center. To the left, one of many parks that the JNF have built. To the right, you can see the sign telling about the establishment of the JNF House of Excellence, a fantastic project by the JNF to give a massive push to secondary school students, both towards the army and academic futures. We will pass the JNF Square, and on the way, take note of the protective bus shelters dotted left and right of the road. By the way, South African JNF have also donated bomb shelters to the new immigrants who arrived in the 1990s to the town of Ofakim, further south from here. We are leaving Steyrot. It is truly a spectacular story. And we are headed to Kibbutz near Am, one of the oldest of the communities from the beginning of the 1940s. Though security is a major challenge, Water for agriculture is no less. Kibbutz near Am sits on a water table and supplied the 11 new communities which were established under the noses of the British on the evening after Yom Kippur in 1946. There's a small museum telling us the story. Today, agricultural water is supplied from the Near Am Reservoir. Water being the source of life. And behind me is the Near Am Reservoir which holds up to a million and a half cubic meters of water. The water, in fact, is not local, but the water comes down from the Shoftan, from the filtration and purifying plants near Tel Aviv. The water goes through different stages of purification to end up over here, and it is the, one of the reasons for the success 
and the flourishing of agriculture here in the area, no longer needing to pump water from the deep ground, but we are now using grey waters, as they are called, purified, and it's good for agriculture. Which makes me turn to the people of Tel Aviv and thank them for all their donations, which they give us daily to be able to fill this reservoir. More importantly, the reservoir was built with the help of Canadian JNF, KKL, and of course, they have a finger in the pie. Thank you very much. We are continuing further south along the border to Kibbutz Nachal Oz, which more or less actually sits on the border with Gaza. And to tell you the truth, I'm a little bit nervous, and I hope it will all be okay. like this you have to speak up why are you dressed like this why am i dressed like this yes it's obvious why <laughs> there are fences over there there's barbed wire there's a border there's a watchtower balloons in the air listen carefully i'm already 45 years a member in this kibbutz be relaxed you know i came here in 75 we used to go to Gaza daily. We had friends there, Palestinians. But during the years, the Hamas take the power and all the situation changed. We see neighbors over there. How far away are they from you? This is the border. It's about 800 meters from the place we stand. That's all, 800 meters. Danny, it hasn't been easy living here, I'm sure. How have you been able to get over all the uh, challenges? In non-normal situation, we determined to live a normal life. And we succeed. Tell me the truth. When your farmers go out in the fields, are they safe? You know, you can't see pat patrols of soldiers. Yeah. It's all cameras, they change the doctrina. They don't uh, send the soldiers with the vehicles, and it's very safe. To be able to achieve all that you've achieved over here is more than just yourselves. And I understand Karen Kayemet, the Jewish National Fund, have helped you. Can you tell me some of the things that they've done? First of all, I really want, in the name of Nachalos, to thank the JNF, because they help out a lot. In what ways? You can see the reservoir. They took 40,000 cube of waste outside to the, clean, the, to reservoir. clean the reservoir. Unbelievable. It's lots of money. Yes. It's millions. Yes. The Palestinians can put uh, mines yeah. in the road. In order to prevent it, you have to put asphalt. That's they did these roads with asphalt so they can put mines. I also heard something called security plantings and security paths. What can you tell me about that? Here, we have our swimming pool. Yes. From Gaza, they can't see the swimming pool because all these trees that we plant with the help of the JNF, all the project of gardening, the new neighborhoods in the kibbutz, the money, came from the JNF. Overseas, yes. Yes, overseas. It's like paradise. Truly amazing. Truly amazing. Call Israel Arevim Zelazeh. And how do you say that in English? Each Jew is responsible for his brother. Yes. All right? Yes. And the communities around the world have been responsible for us. Danny, thank you very much. You're a brave guy. We are leaving by the back gate of the kibbutz. What can I tell you? I admire these people living here so much, despite the situation, and they are even growing. However, not every community has survived. Let's visit for a moment one who didn't. The Zionist dream of living in this area on the border isn't new. 
In 1943, a group of religious Zionist youth from Bnei Akiva, from the Mizrahi movement, come to this area and they establish a kibbutz called Beirot Yitzchak. Beirot Yitzchak, over the couple of years that they are here, manage to start agriculture which hasn't been seen here for maybe hundreds, if not a thousand years. In 1948, unfortunately, the Egyptians target this area and bomb the hell out of it. There's nothing left of the kibbutz, and all we have ahead of us is the remains of a water tower. Kibbutz Berot Yitzchak didn't give up. They have a dream, a Zionist dream. And within a number of years, they already re-established in a new kibbutz, in a new site, not far from the present day airport of Ben Gurion. That's a Zionist dream. We look always to the future, not to the past. We are now traveling on agricultural roads that the JNF has built for the benefit of farmers. To our left is Kibbutz Alumim, and ahead of us, Kibbutz Be'iri, another one of those 11 points established in 1946. Behind the Kibbutz is the JNF Firefighters Command Post, with the observation tower next to it. I'm here with Michael, he's from the southern region of the JNF. Tell me, where are we? We are here actually in the very heart of the Western region, which is one of the largest probably regions of uh, KKL. It spans from uh, the very fence of the Gaza Strip up to Beersheba in the east. All this uh, desert afforestation uh, project runs from Elat to Ashdod, more or less, which is a very vast territory over the 16,000 hectares. What have been the major challenges that you've had to face here with forestation here in the desert? The main challenge is the climate itself. Of course, the major point of this climate is the water availability to the vegetation, which makes us base our activity on a lot of science and a lot of uh, experiments that we put. And I understand, looking at the newspapers, history over the last two, three years, you've had another challenge. Yeah, we have another challenge, which is the forest fires. Being very close to the Gaza Strip, this is actually the focal point of the firefighting activity of the region and maybe of the entire district. How much damage has been done to forestation and to agriculture because of the fires? Approximately 4,000 dunams of the forest has been damaged, which were particularly lowered this uh, year because we made some preparations and uh, becoming more sophisticated. Crew is a group of people of very fast and first respond to the fire. And this here is one of the gathering point, which saves the responding time, which is very important. And of course, this has an influence on our ability to, to protect the area. Over the last couple of years, I've been reading in the newspapers about something called security planting, Yorbit Khoni. What is it? This is a very large and very important project that we started back in 2012 after shootings on a pupil's bus that killed actually the, the one of the pupils. This project we started with planting vast areas around the communities and along the railways and uh, roads. It serves us as a screen actually that prevents the snipers from the Gaza Strip to see the vehicle or to see the house and to shoot it directly. Part of the security tree planting project along the Gaza border was achieved through donations of JNF South Africa. Michael, I want to thank you very much. Thank Absolutely you. fascinating. But I'm getting a message in my earphone that further to the west, that there is a fire and they're asking us to deal with it. Good news, I'm happy to report that the fire was extinguished with minimum damage. But more important, the firefighters returned safely to their base. By the way, the command post is located next to another security site, 
which has a very interesting story. Part of the story about the Second World War with the British, Rommel is already being successful in North Africa and this is one of the areas closest to the south that um, the British High Command are trying to make a defensive line. Tremendous amounts of uh, forces were here and here was one of the major stores that they used to store their ammunition in bunkers, each one separate from a different one. They were protected against fire. If one, God forbid, would explode, then it wouldn't damage the other ones. And 80 years later, this is what we have left here in the Middle East, here in Israel, reminding us of those days. And having mentioned the Second World War, with your permission, let's go back and discuss World War I. Hello mates, back in Australia, this is Bruce, I'm here in Israel and I'm here after two nasty battles facing the town of Gaza which is over there. We arrived in the area at the beginning of the year in 1917 and on the 26th of March we and all the uh, allied forces in the area attack the town of Gaza. We know that if Gaza falls then the entrance to the land of Israel will be open. Guys, we attacked with full force and we're Australians and we know how to fight. And we, the Australian soldiers, get almost to the center of Gaza. We get to the hill, the highest point of Gaza, Ali Muntah, and all of a sudden, some jackass of a British general, he tells us, withdraw. Withdraw, I can't believe it. We've left dead in the field, Johnny and Bernie, and old Bugsy, they're out lying there at the moment. And worse than that, I'm not, you know what? It makes me sick to even think about it. Because it's the same jackasses who sent us to Gallipoli. But now I'm going to tell you about the second battle. And that second battle, we do exactly the same thing. And the Australian soldiers go ahead. And we're the spearhead of all the attacks. The British think they're clever. And they bring some new fangled machinery called a tank. And these tanks, a crap, which makes so much noise and gives away the elements of surprise. And once again, we as the Australians, we get almost to the end. We get through all the obstacles. We actually see the whites of the eyes of Johnny Turf. It's hot, it's dusty, we're in the desert. There are flies and fleas. There are mosquitoes, the size of small horses. And once again, the battle collapses and we withdraw and we've been here now for the last couple of months in this area. Now I can't shout and I've got to tell you a secret. This is a military secret and don't tell anybody. The British generals have changed. The old idiots have moved out. General Allenby has been brought in. General Allenby, he's a revolutionary soldier and he trusts us Australians and he knows our ability. And what he has decided to do is that we're going to quiet we're going to quietly leave the area. We're going to leave Gaza, let Johnny Turk think that we're still sitting here. And instead, we're going to go all the way around. And we're going to attack, not Gaza, we're going to attack the Sheva in that direction. The plans are for a cavalry charge. And we, as the Australian light cavalry, we're going to spearhead it. And once that falls, Gaza, like a ripe piece of fruit, will fall in our hands. Send blessings home. Give my girlfriend Matilda a good kiss. By the way, I didn't ask how my sister Sheila is. How is she? She's doing okay? Speak to you after the battle. Bye. It is also important to stress that South African soldiers also fought here during the First World War. The most famous unit was the Cape Corps Infantry Unit which excelled at the Megiddo campaign. They fought with great heroism on the eastern side of the Ottoman lines, north of Ramallah. At a place called Square Hill, a fierce battle was fought in an attempt to capture Khirbet Jibet. Over 50 soldiers were killed 
and most of the officers died. Two captured Turkish artillery pieces were brought back to South Africa. Most interestingly, till today, no memorial to the battle has been erected at the site. I'm feeling a little bit hungry, aren't you? Let's go for a picnic. I know of a lovely place. You want to come and join me? I'm sitting here on the banks of the Absor stream in the Eshkol National Park. What a better place to have a picnic, the best of Israeli food. Guys, come and join me. I can't finish it all myself. Park Eshkol, named after Levi Eshkol, the Israeli Prime Minister, is located on the road between Ofakim and Kibbutz Gvulot on the banks of the Nachal Absor, the Absor River. The park was established in the 1960s on a 3,000 dunam plot and the South African JNF KKL gave a large helping hand. In the centre of the park are the Absor Shalala Springs. The park is well equipped with picnic spots and playgrounds and even has a paddling pool for kids. There are two archaeological sites, one from the early Canaanite period and another we will soon discuss. This park is truly amazing. Let's visit it. Behind me, we have an interesting hill. And at the moment, for us, it's just a hill called Givat Shalala. If you remember earlier, we were in Beiri and we heard about the Anzac story. The British, the Australian soldiers with their horses, they've got problems with water. And here in the park, they managed to find an incredible source of water that we've seen earlier. But to be able to capture the place, they need to capture a hill behind us where there is a Turkish machine gun nest. And once captured, the Australian soldiers start looking around and they find that on the ground, on the floor, there's a mosaic. And that mosaic turns out to be one of great beauty. The Australian soldiers feel that it's theirs. And before you know it, it's been cut up into pieces, loaded onto camels. To make a long story very short, it turns up in Canberra and where today it lies in the war memorial in Canberra to the Anzac soldiers. General Allenby understood the importance of water sources, especially during the long preparation for the outflanking manoeuvre. He decided to build a reservoir and also a railway to provide water for all the forces in the area. What remains today from this project are the foundations of the bridge over the Absor river bed. I hope you all enjoy the picnic of local cheeses and wines. We will travel south along the Absor river bed, that same route where the Anzac soldiers rode on the night of the 30th of October, 1917. I ask myself, could those Anzac horsemen imagine what would be situated here 80 years later? So during the 1990s, Action Plan Negev had the idea of bringing a whole new life down to the Negev, including tourism including new villages, including places of work and agriculture, hothouses, but it all needs water. The plan was to be able to anchor the waters flowing in Nachal Absor below us and to bring them into a collection area of about half a million cubic meters of water. There are pumps which will then pump water up to the reservoir on the hill over there. And when that is full, waters are then pumped through pipes to this massive reservoir behind us, all in all, 10 million cubic meters of water, a project, the one behind me, which is a joint project between South African and UK JNF. So that's it, we are on our way to our last stop, and we are traveling along the scenic routes 
and next to the Apso riverbed. And soon we will see the suspended bridge above the riverbed. Have you noticed, by the way, the thousands of dunam of fruit orchards that have been planted in the Negev, all thanks to the reservoirs? Continuing south and just before the Egyptian border, we will turn left to the area known as the Khalutziot, a true desert miracle story. Rabbi Adler, good to see you again. How are you keeping? Thank you. Tell me, where are we? We are in uh, Khalutza, in the western Negev, right near the border of Egypt and the Gaza Strip. When you spoke about the we, who are we? We are a community that was evacuated uh, from Gush Katif 15 years ago. And uh, after we went through the uh, painful evacuation from Gush Katif, we had to make a decision where we want to continue, what's our next goal. And then the State of Israel came to us and told us, listen, the most important uh, place to uh, settle these days is Chalutza. Tell me, you didn't have enough trauma. You didn't have enough tough life. You got to come over here. You're right. It wasn't such a simple uh, decision, you know, to wake up the day after and uh, decide that you're continuing and you're going like to start a new uh, Zionistic uh, movement. We were part of a new area, which is called the Chalutza region. We have three communities here, Shlomit, Nave, and Bnei Netzarim. Tell me, I see buildings, I see playgrounds, I see trees, gardens. Could you have done this by yourself? How did you manage to do it? This is like a joint venture with three partners. First of all, the first 15 families that decided to come here, which were really uh, pioneers. But after that, you can't build these kind of communities without the help of the Israeli government and without the help of Jewish world. And the movement which brought help from all over the world here, it was JNF, KKL, which um, right away when we came here, we built very, very strong and close connections with them and many groups came and visited here. And once they saw our needs in all terms, not only uh, you know, water reserves and forests, but everything which has to do with our community life here was done by them. Today we have here about 300 new families. We have a very big uh, business here of agriculture. We have greenhouses, we have fields, and we export to all over the world. We have um, uh, factories here, we have schools, we have a pre-army uh, yeshiva here. Boys and girls come here from all over Israel because they know that in this area we have a very, very high quality education system. We have waiting lists of families that want to come here. Even though we are in an area which is very far out in the Negev, we say in Hebrew, Sofa Olam Smola, the end of the world left. This is where we are. I really believe that what happened to us in the last 15 years here is a real miracle. Rabbi Eli, I'm, I'm jealous. The next empty house, you remember me, okay? Okay. But listen, maybe instead of just talking, let's go to see the agriculture. Let's go see the community. And seeing is believing. So I'll let you into a secret. I'm also a bit of a pioneer. תודה, <laughs> מאיפה לקחתם כל המים? המים בהתחלה באו מאשקלון, ולאורך השנים שיפרו את המים, הוזילו את המים בעזרת JNF, עזרת קק"ל, ועד לפה הביאו צינורות של השפדן, שבסוף עוזר לנו לגדול באמת הרבה, ובעלויות מאוד נמוכות. מה אתם מגדלים? זה משק של ירקות עלים. בערך על 200 דונם חממות אנחנו מגדלים שמונה מוצרים, ולאורך כל השנה. הרב אלי אדלר אמר עכשיו שהגעתם למקום שזה סוף העולם שמאלה. מה החשיבות של המקום הזה הספציפי המדברי? קודם כל ציונות. זה זה מתחיל. 
באנו פה להפריח את השממה, פשוטו כמשמעו. מה, אנחנו יודעים שהגבול קרוב, גם עזה, גם מצרים, הכול כל כך קרוב, שאם לא נהיה פה ונאבד את השדות ונגדל חממות, לא יודע מה כן נהיה פה. אני לא רוצה לחשוב על זה. יאללה, ביי. באת לדבר או באת לעבוד? חלאס עם השאלות. יאללה. So my friends, we've come to the end of our tour here in the Chalutziot, in the Yishuv of Naveh. We've seen and we've met incredible people. We've heard stories about Zionism. We've heard stories about pioneering. And this is truly the, uh, the fruit of work of the last 15 years or so. We're standing on a place called Givat Kakal, the Hill of Kakal. Because 15 years ago, when there was nothing around and there was no agriculture at all, the tractors of the JNF stood here and from here they went out to work every day and since then it's been given the name of Givat Kakal. And in a sentence I would say this is pioneering of the 21st century. These are pioneers, we know the history, but these are modern day pioneers here in the desert making it flourish and bloom. The end of a perfect day, the sun is sinking into the sea to the west. We came to try to understand what it means to live here in the western Negev, in the area around the Gaza Strip. We visited communities and met people living on the border in Zikim, in Shteirot and Nachal Oz. Areas which for years have been under Qassam missile attack. We heard about JNF projects building protective playgrounds for children as well as security plantings and roads. We saw a center for stress relief in Shteirot using animals. I do not even need to mention the bomb-proof bus stops that the JNF have invested in. And of course, we visited the JNF firefighters forward command post in Be'eri, who combat the latest threat of incendiary balloons. While security is a major problem, water for agriculture is no less of a challenge. We saw the Nir Am and Hapsor reservoirs, both major JNF projects, which provide water for agriculture and which have made the desert bloom. The fact that this whole area is so far away from the center of the country has also been addressed by the JNF. Plans to help local youngsters to succeed are in the pipeline with the building of the Center for Excellence. Moreover, major investments in infrastructure for new neighborhoods in Shteirot, the Kibbutzim, and the other communities are another. And the JNF were very active in commemorating the First World War Anzac campaign. Battle sites in the light horse outflanking maneuver has been memorialized by the JNF. We also mentioned the contribution of South African soldiers. Friends, it's been a pleasure to be with you. And my dream is that within the near future, this won't be a virtual tour, but we'll be doing it together, and that we'll be rolling around in the dust of the land of Israel as friends. Be well. Bye. We would like to thank and acknowledge our many supporters and their ancestors in South Africa for their generous contributions over the last 120 years. Thank you very much to KKL for that amazing tour of uh, part of Israel that most of us have never ever seen before. Now, now we're going to do a um, quick Q&A session with Brian, the tour guide. So stay on and please um, post your questions in the chat. If there's anything you'd like to, uh, to ask Brian, um, we'd be, we're going to ask him. Brian, uh, are you with us? Can you unmute? Yes, I'm definitely here. Hey, Brian. Well, thank you very much. It was really a great, a great tour. You, you uh, got a big fan base now here in South Africa. 
Okay, so you know where to send the Oscar, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Brian, maybe we can start. You can tell us um, what it is about the people of the Negev that drives them, you know, such, to live mm. under such harsh environmental and uh, security conditions, and yet they thrive and continue to, uh, you know, inspire us all. What is it about, about the, the people that makes them stay and, and, and build those communities? I think it's a belief in a dream. They have a dream of creating and uh, making something flourish. And through all the challenges, they're prepared to stay there through their mistakes and through their successes till they finally come to make sure that something is going to be a success as we've seen it is. I think it's also, they have a tremendous backbone. They've got the ability to be able to suffer things that maybe other people can't. And I'm very, very, I'm full of admiration for these people. Great, thanks, Brian. So one of the questions we've got, which is, what is KKL? So KKL is the Hebrew name for JNF. Karen Kayemet Israel. Um, Brian, I, I wanted to, I know you touched on some of the South African sites and some of the contributions that South Africans have made. Um, you know, I think um, a lot of people here don't actually know about um, the kind of, of, of contributions that South Africans have made to the, the development of the land of Israel. And I think one, you know, one, what we, you showed us um, that kindergarten where uh, the Samson family helped to build a, a protection so that the children can actually play. I know it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, Eric, the late Eric Samson passed away this, uh, this month. He was a great contributor to, um, to the JNF and, and obviously to the land of Israel. And he's going to be, be sorely missed. Um, maybe you could just explain to people how that, that, um, that actual kindergarten and that uh, protective cover for the children has helped make, make their lives more bearable. It allows children to be able to grow in an impossible situation within normal boundaries. The children are able to play normally, but they're also trained that when there will be a siren, within those couple of seconds, they're able to start running to be within a protective area. And uh, without it, I think those children would be far more traumatized uh, than they, they might be. Uh, it's really allowed them to be able to grow up normally. And that is one of the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to have families growing up normally in an impossible situation. Amazing. Really, truly in, in, inspiring. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the webinar wants to ask any other questions. Um, I, I was personally really um, intrigued. You mentioned uh, you spent a lot of time talking about the Anzac soldiers, but a lot of, not a lot of attention is given to the South African troops that fought, um, that fought in the war around the Gaza border. Um, most people don't know that, that they were colored soldiers um, from South Africa that fought. And uh, you mentioned that no memorials actually ever been put up in their honor. Maybe that's something you could just uh, chat about. Did you know why? Or? I, I, I can't give you a reason why not. I'm surprised myself. And possibly it's high time that these uh, soldiers should be acknowledged and recognized. Um, they're part of a push that without them, I doubt if Allenby would have been able to achieve what he did achieve. And I think it's maybe time to recognize 103 years afterwards to put up a memorial uh, for what they did. I think that's very true. Definitely something that uh, we're going we're gonna to work on. Great. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions for Brian. Um, where do you actually live, Brian? Where in Israel do you live? So I live northwest of Jerusalem in a small village called Givadzev. So there is really one hilltop between myself and uh, Jerusalem. Uh, we're in the biblical area of Binyamin, the tribe of Binyamin. And um, yeah, I've been here for the last 35 years. Great, great. And do you take, out, without Corona, do you take a lot of guides? Is that your, is that your thing? Yes, I'm, I'm a tour guide. Mm -hmm. And uh, without Corona, I would, I would not be here now. I'd be out with a group. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And so, um, 
what's what's your favorite part of of Israel to visit for tourists? If we if we come, where 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 would you recommend we come for our next tour? So, where I live, um, ten minutes drive from where I live is the tomb of Samuel the prophet, with the most astounding view, 360 degrees. There's an incredible view of the biblical land of Israel. Um, and it's a place where many people don't know, just like we've had a tour now in the Western Negev. People don't know it's around the tomb of Samuel the prophet. People are also unaware. And I invite you to come to one of my favorite playgrounds. Uh, it's so much history, uh, both modern and ancient and biblical. There's so much archaeology. There's so much nature. It would do all your souls good to be with me for one day there. We, when hopefully after Corona, we'll, we'll all hope to be with you soon. And then we can and finish the day off. questions in, coming in. Oh. Let's say again. I'm saying and we could finish the day off in my garden. I've got fruit trees. We're talking about Tobi Shvat. You can sit in the shade of the fruit trees. And uh, depending on the time of the year, I would have fruit for you. Fresh fruit. <laughs> Great. Someone asked a question, where is all of this in relation to a lat? That's probably the most most South Africans know of the, of the South. Okay, so a lat is the most southern corner of Israel. Uh, we are in the middle of Israel. You have to go north. Um, distances are short in terms poss possibly of South African measurements. About 250, 300 uh, kilometers north of a lat is Jerusalem. And I am just northwest of uh, Jerusalem. And the part of, of the south that we saw in the video today, how far would that be from Eilat? That, near, would, near possibly, Gaza, that would possibly be about uh, 200, 200 kilometers north of Eilat. Uh, if you remember the map, I don't have a map with me for the moment, but if you look at the map... It's a V shape. It's a V, sorry, so the, it's, it's at the top of the, uh, uh, that V shape on the left-hand side, the Gaza Strip, and the envelope area around it. Um, one question someone asked is, where are you originally from? So <laughs> I'm not from South Africa. I was born in England. <laughs> we get no, I was born in England. My, um, I've been here for 40 years. This is my 40th year in Israel. I've been here longer than half of the country. I've seen incredible <laughs> changes um, and I'm very, very proud. Uh, to, have, to have been here for so long and for the changes that I've seen, it's absolutely incredible. One question somebody asked, um, you know, at the end of the video, you showed us um, one of the Jewish communities from Gaza that was relocated. Um, um, the question is, uh, are there others? Is that the only example of, of communities that were, that were evacuated or um, are there examples of other Jewish communities uh, communities from Gaza that have re rebuilt themselves inside Israel? There, there are many of them. Surprisingly, those people who were, went through the trauma of being uprooted and evacuated uh, were positive. And what they wanted to do was to continue with the Zionist dream. Uh, the question was, where are we now needed? And just like we saw in the uh, Chalutza, in the Chalutziot, these people wanted to do something positive, uh, other villages have also been established. Other small towns have been established. The, many of the communities remained as a community and have continued being so creative in the new places that they are. The, quest, the question really was, amazing. where are we now needed? And that's how they did it. Amazing. After being you know, uprooted from their homes, it's quite, oh, a, yeah. quite a thing. They're still yeah. committed. Um, Brian, you've got a lot of supporters here in South Africa. They want to know how they can organize a tour of you and that, with you when they come to Israel, but we'll be happy at JNF to help facilitate that. And uh, there's also lots of comments asking for what's the next virtual tour going to be. So that's to Orna and KKL. Um, <laughs> there's big demand for another tour, maybe. In a big demand, months. yes. Sir. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Um, where, We've where also they done decide? a lot of wonderful South African projects up north. We maybe can... Yeah, let's aim to the Galilee. We can Definitely. aim for the Galilee. There's also yeah. wonderful, wonderful stuff happening up north. Definitely. Michael, uh, can I say uh, hello? 
Yes, of course. Okay. Come in, say hello. So hi everyone, my name is Shlomo. I'm the, the head of the incoming tourist department, we can say, or the missions. Uh, and I've been working with Isla for many years. And we were very happy also to organize this virtual tour for you uh, with a brilliant guy named Brian. And uh, thank you uh, him for, for all the effort he did. And we're really looking for uh, to see you here, not in virtual, but in reality very soon coming with the group uh, as we did in the past, visiting all those marvelous and uh, wonderful uh, project that uh, you are contributing to. And uh, I would like also to thank Ona for all the efforts she did uh, on our side here with my team, uh, my um, department. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to do a more a moment virtual tours and in the future uh, real tours with you together, and I thank all the participants, of course, that join us today. And thanks to South Africa, JNF South Africa. Great, also, thank you everybody for joining. Yeah. I wanted to Go just ahead, give Brian. a shout out to Ayla. I remember three, four years ago, we had uh, a mission, and uh, first your organization and the way you ruled it, and uh, it was absolutely incredible. We, and we got to the end in one piece and we enjoyed it all. <laughs> Thank you, Aida. One question we have uh, from the audience is uh, Kibbutz Erez. Um, uh, Bernice Fine's husband was there during the Six Day War and she says, is it still there? <laughs> oh, yes. Does anyone know? Yeah, yes, it is. It's still there. Yes. Right. Yes. Doing well. It's doing excellent. It's yes. flourishing, we hope. <laughs> thank God. Great. Well, thank you, everybody who, who, who came. Um, someone's asked for donation details. So um, you can contact the JNF office. We'll send out an email to all the people that registered so that you can... Um, there we go. Thank you. Uh, you can contact the JNF office on 011-645-2579 or email Bev Schneider at uh, bschneider at jnfsa.co.za. Um, and um, we'll send out an email as well, and everyone will have a chance um, to plant a tree in Israel or a tree in South Africa at one of our environmental centers. And we look forward to working with you in the future. We're a new JNF committee. We hope to have lots of events. This is just the start of an exciting year and uh, wishing everybody a happy Tu uh, Bishvat and... Uh, a good year ahead. Thanks Thank all. You. Thanks everyone for all the help. Thank you. Thanks, Samir. Bye bye. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Samir.